morning, everybody, and welcome to the second set of lectures that will lecture three and four. And the title of lecture three is Definition and Informative Concepts of Doctor Polarimetric Radical Variables. In this lecture, we'll uh, talk in more detail about uh, each of the variables, trying to figure out what is the physical meaning of every variable and uh, how to utilize that practical applications. Uh, we need to start from a very, very simple uh, expressions for the scattering amplitudes that determine most of these variables. And uh, you remember that in the previous lectures, lecture one or lecture two, we determined the so-called uh, scattering amplitudes uh, also scattering coefficients, we can call them for elements of the scattering matrix. And uh, SA means that if the scattering uh, amplitude, if uh, the uh, spheroid, board, in the spheroid uh, with the axis A, axis, say, axis A, Agnes B is illuminated like, like raindrops. Wash raindrop is illuminated with the uh, uh, the wave of vertical polarization, okay, which is oriented vertically, and uh, the response will be S A. And if the same raindrops, wash raindrops, is illuminated with the wave of uh, horizontal polarization uh, along the axis B, so we. Uh, distinguish it as a scattering amplitude as B. As B. And here now there's uh, the simple uh, closed form uh, solution and expression for these two scattering amplitudes. Uh, they are valid only if the scatterers are relatively small compared to the wavelength. And, uh, this is a so-called uh, resonance parameter. It's our definition of that uh, uh, ratio. So it includes both uh, the diameter, rather wavelength, and also square root of the uh, absolute value of square root of the, of the electric constant. So if this ratio is less than, say, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, then we, uh, we can safely use this simple formula which tells us that uh, the scattering amplitude is proportional to the particle volume, e to the third, and inversely proportional to lambda squared. And here is a, a special factor that characterizes dependence of the scattering coefficient on, uh, on a uh, hydrometer shape, which is so-called uh, shape factor, and also the electric constant of the uh, uh, of the hydrometer. For a spherical particle, this uh, shape factors for A and B for two directions are the same, equal to 1.3. And so uh, this factor, psi A equal to psi B, and it's very simple equation like that. And if we uh, substitute uh, the expression for this factor into this formula, we are getting very simple relation for the scattering coefficients or the scattering amplitudes. Okay, and there are other cross sections, again, that was mentioned in the first lecture, is proportional to absolute value of squared of the S and S B, and we are getting a very standard and very well known formula for so called relay scattering. This relay scattering that explains uh, the color of the sky in the optical uh, range uh, of, uh, of rather wavelength uh, because of this lambda divided, lambda by four and inverted dependent. So the, the blue actually gets much bigger uh, than uh, the, the reflection from the, uh, for the, uh, of the blue, color of the blue. Um, uh, range of frequencies is much, is much larger because 
ладно, это будет зло, это ладно, это ладно, это ред. Я с вами первый был сказать. Окей, of course, we have SA equal to SB, like in the case of spherical particles, the, the ratio which is proportional to uh, a ratio squared proportional to differential reflectivity is equal to 1. So differential reflectivity in log scale is uh, equal to 0, 0 dB. Alright, here the, uh, the the explicit expressions for the factor of LA and LLB and uh, they depend only on the, on the aspect ratio so the ratio between the, the two axes of this non-spherical hydrogen so two different formulas for a blade spheroid is like, like that and the controlled spheroid if we have something like needles for example okay, uh, as, uh, as a black uh, hydrometers and crystals so we have a, a different formula, but again, uh, both L and LLB are uh, determined uh, entirely by the ratio of these two angles, or aspect ratio of the hydrometer. And these are, and these are the dependencies uh, of these factors LA and LB on the A over B ratio. On the aspect ratio. So, as I already mentioned, if the uh, A is equal to B, in other words, if the hydrometer is spherical, then both L and uh, LB are equal to one third. Okay, however, it's, it's very non spherical, so we may have one of them is equal to zero, another of them is equal to one. That means that uh, we have a big difference either one or zero in this denominator. That determines the big difference in the S and A and S B. And that means that uh, our differential effectivity, for example, will be very large in this particular case. Uh, but also uh, from this simple formula, it is clear that if uh, for a given dielectric constant, which is determined by density and water content, uh, the difference between S A and S B all polarimetric contrasts between uh, uh, horizontal and vertical polarizations uh, increases once the difference between L, uh, L A and L B increases. Okay. So, uh, however, for the given L A and L B, for example, this pair of L A and L B, this factor depends on epsilon as well. It's something that people are uh, 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 routinely missing when they, uh, when they uh, try, try to interpret uh, polymetric values. It's very essential and strong dependence on the, the electric constant. In other words, SA and SB and their difference, their ratio, for the given shape of hydrometers, for the given size of hydrometers, determines on, the, on what actually feels that hydrometer. So if look here, just if epsilon is very is very large, like in the case of say pure water, it's about 100. Okay, then this uh, factor is very is very close to zero. That means that everything uh, is determined by the, uh, the, 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 the the denominator is equal to L A and L B, and uh, the difference between L, L, A, and L, B determines the difference in the scattering coefficients. However, if it's very close, say, to 1, like in a, uh, in, in a very, uh, um, in a snow, I would say, very aggregated snow with very low density, okay, then this uh, factor becomes very large, because 1 minus almost 1, it becomes very large. So that means that this, the role of this term is an important, is not significant. That means that if we are talking about snowflakes, very fluffy snowflakes, okay, uh, regardless of the shape factor, their scattering coefficient will be quite close. And that explains why differential objectivity of aggregated, dry aggregated snow is very low. We'll talk about that a little bit more 
So resonance scattering, um, uh, well, uh, again, I reiterate that the resonance parameter here should be less than 0.3.4 for relay formulas for that simple closed form analytical solution to be valid. However, if it approaches, say, 1 or something like that, or becomes a little larger than 1, then those formulas are not valid anymore. We need to use very sophisticated, either so-called mescattering theory uh, that was uh, uh, first suggested by, uh, uh, by me for pure spherical uh, particles, or use the so-called T-matrix uh, computations for spheroidal particles, spheroidal particles with uh, two, say, the different layers, okay, which are not closed form solution at all. We cannot come up with simple analytical formulas, but uh, a lot of, but a lot of physical interpretations can be done basically based on very, these very simple solutions over here. So in general, however, if you are talking about quantitative estimation, of course we need to uh, we need to use those either knee solution or thematic solution to do that. And these are this table shows the limits of applicability of relay formulas, uh, provided that we uh, uh, require the accuracy of rather effectivity estimation of one dB, differential effectivity one tenth of dB, and uh, the measurement of specific differential phase of about twenty percent. That means that we can safely use those relay formulas basically for most raindrops in, at S band, at about 10, 11 centimeters. Okay, for C band, uh, because of the factor of lambda, those formulas are valid in a, in a smaller range of sizes. And on X band, which we are, uh, the rather which we are using, uh, operating in X band, so we have to be very careful. In other words, only for drops smaller than 2.3 millimeters and uh, I would say graupel particles less than 3 millimeters we can uh, safely utilize this analytical formula. Okay, so for, for larger size particles we need to uh, use much more complicated uh, uh, computer codes. And uh, why we have such a complication? When, we, uh, uh, when, the, when, when the size of particles increases. Uh, here this is a, uh, this is, uh, all we, call, we, we, we talk about the so-called resonance effects. Um, this is, uh, the resonance effects is, uh, is basically the interference. And here we are not showing uh, any sort of steroids or this simple cartoon that's showing how interference occurs in the case of, say, some sort of dielectric slab, something like that. Okay, there are two waves that uh, uh, illuminate the slab. Okay, just with the way one way illuminating the slab. The part of the way is reflected from this boundary, and the part of the way actually penetrates into the slab and relates from the second boundary, and then reflects from the second boundary. Okay, and because uh, the, 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 the phase difference between these two uh, waves is determined by the, uh, by, uh, by the thickness of this slab, its, uh, its refractive index and, uh, and wavelength. So when we sum up these two waves, actually, that what actually is being uh, reflected uh, and propagated towards the radar and actually intercepted by the radar antenna, so we have sort of a sum of the wave reflected from this boundary and inner boundary, I mean this, this outer boundary. Okay, and everything depends on what is the, what is this exponent here, for example, I mean the size of the, 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 the exponent of that. So they can, they can um, um, sum up either in phase or out of phase. So if they sum out of phase, then they may cancel each other. Okay. So, and if they are in phase, they can amplify each other. That's why if you are talking about the uh, strength 
an amplitude of wave, which is the sum of these two waves reflected from these two uh, boundaries in the slab, okay, we are getting non-monotonic dependence on the sides. So and that and, and uh, if uh, if the particle has no losses or uh, slab has no losses inside, then usually they can cancel each other, uh, 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 can cancel each other uh, perfectly. So we can have just simply zero uh, strength of the reflective wave. If there are some losses, then this wave, uh, the amplitude of this wave reflected from the uh, uh, second boundary is uh, attenuated. Okay, the, the full constellation doesn't occur. But that's the basic uh, principle of uh, any uh, interferometry. So, and that means that we, uh, the, the reflected wave, this reflected wave, and this reflected wave, they do not cancel each other. <coughs> so we get some, some sort of this, this dependence. And in the case, and again, another thing. Uh, it's important that the, the sizes and what, what, what is called and this sort of dependence and this sort of interference effects uh, sometimes is called resonance scattering. Okay, that, that, that term is widely utilized in the, in the scattering theory for hydrometers. So there are certain sizes when we have these very strong changes in the, uh, in the scattering coefficients or the uh, the strength of reflected wave. And those sizes are proportional to lambda and inversely proportional to a real part of the refractive index. This can be seen from this single consideration. So, and that will, little, uh, this has to be taken into account when we are working with uh, different wavelengths. For example, we would like to uh, composite the network of the radius with C band and uh, X band operating. Or S band, okay. Then we need to uh, we need to take this into account. All the rest of the sizes for different wavelengths are, uh, are very different. And I will uh, illustrate that uh, a little bit later. All right. Let's start with rather reflectivity factor. Rather reflectivity factor is characterized the power of reflected signal, so it's proportional to the um, is proportional to the concentration of the particles, and also it's somehow proportional to the size of the particles. And this is the uh, a very general definition for this uh, rather reflectivity factor expressed in linear scale. Okay, it depends on a um, uh, on a square of the absolute value of the scattering amplitudes average over the ensemble of scatterers. Because every radar resolution volume contains uh, millions of particles. And we need to uh, sum them up or in some sort of a big, big grand average over the ensemble. Okay. Here this factor Kw uh, is a factor that is always directly constant of water, not of the or not of the particle. Okay. And angular brackets mean ensemble average. So if it is spherical particles, for example, okay, then uh, the ensemble average is equal simply to ensemble average of the scattering amplitudes along A and B axis, and then these are equal, okay, and this, uh, and, and, we, and we can get this sort of a simple expression uh, for the uh, average uh, square of the absolute values of scattering coefficient. So it's proportional to, uh, to, to the product of these three different variables. Okay, and uh, if we take this, for example, if epsilon doesn't depend on the size, so we can take it out of this uh, integration, then we are arriving at this simple form. And in the case of spherical raindrops, when epsilon is equal to epsilon w here, so these two things are cancelled out, and we are left with simply averaging over d6, d, d to the 6. And we are getting this very standard and very well-known formula for, for reflectivity, the 
sixth moment of sine distribution. N of D is a sine distribution. Again, this formula is valid only in a very special case when we have, when we have first of all, raindrops with the electric constant of water, and when these raindrops are purely spherical. Okay. In fact, they are not purely spherical, and uh, that's why we have a difference between, say, uh, rather reflecting this horizontal and vertical polarization, because uh, uh, if this is not uh, held, then we are, have difference between this and this factor over there. So these are not to uh, If you are talking, we are still talking about spherical particles, but instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, rain, we have spherical ground or hail. The expression for other repetitive factor can be written like this. So we still uh, have as a factor the sixth moment of size distribution, but there is a certain term over here that makes difference from the uh, reflection by pure raindrops. Because, for example, if epsilon is equal to epsilon of pure ice, bulk ice, say with a uh, uh, density of 0.92 gram per centimeter cube. Then this ratio is equal to about 0.90. Okay. So then this, this coefficient, in other words, the rather effectivity for hail is about uh, five times less than the corresponding rather effectivity for angles if they have perfectly the same size distribution of face the same sizes. Okay. So if you take 10 logarithms of that, which is, which is uh, uh, the standard definition of uh, rather effective logarithmic scale, so we find out the difference of about 7 dB. 7 dB is a big difference, a big difference, 7.2 dB. That means that the same distribution, the same sizes of, say, Graupel and Hainstones Okay, to produce 7 dB less rather effectivity than, uh, than, than raindrops. Uh, if you are talking about spherical dry snowflakes, dry snowflakes, so again from the formulas that can be found in the second lecture, okay, we can uh, arrive at this uh, expression for rather effectivity. So it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated here. And the reason for that is that you cannot take out this epsilon out of uh, sine of integration. And here we have also a density factor, density of snow, which is a function of size. That's why we cannot take it out of integral. So, and again, we have this, uh, uh, the, the ratio of this term, and we have this uh, density of solid ice. So, and uh, Again, in, in the previous lecture, uh, there was a slide that uh, illustrated the, the inverse dependence of snow on, the, on its size. Usually, uh, the density of snow increases inversely proportional to size, approximately, okay, with size. So that means that ZH, uh, if, we, if we substitute D minus 1 over here in this form, they will figure out that the ZH becomes not the sixth moment of size distribution, but the fourth moment of size distribution. So that means it's much less, uh, it's much less dependent on very large particles. Because D to the six is extremely strong dependence. That means that one, uh, say, one centimeter raindrop, or, whatever, one, centimeter, or one, one millimeter raindrop, produces the same power as one million of ten times smaller raindrops. It's a huge and very strong dependence. However, if we are talking about solid hydrometers or dry snowflakes, it's not like that. So it's not million or ten thousand, it's a four order of magnitude, but still a big still a big number. So the problem with rather reflectivity is so much weighted by 
few big hydrometers. But sometimes it's, it's a, uh, that, that, that is, uh, uh, it's considered not a good uh, characterization of the physical uh, properties of the hydrometers. For example, liquid water content or rain rate, etc., etc. I will talk about that later. Uh, these are general formulas for other reflectivity. Okay, it's very, uh, it's very different from that standard uh, D to the six formula. All right, they're not look very uh, appealing to eye, very friendly, but that what is should be utilized for uh, very arbitrary size distribution, uh, arbitrary uh, uh, distribution of orientation. Etc. Etc. Here we are. Uh, here all this S B and S A. Those are scattering coefficients. Okay, standard scattering coefficients. And A one, A four, the angular moments we uh, discussed them briefly in the previous lecture. And these are dependencies of uh, rather effectivity factor on the diameter, on the volume diameter of the uh, raindrops, in the case of raindrops. And here, what we mean by that, uh, it is normalized rather effectivity factor. That means that, okay, uh, if we have, say, raindrops of only 2 millimeters, only 2 millimeters, uh, more dispersed distribution of uh, raindrops, okay, then what is shown here is that, for example, if we have, a, say, concentration of M uh, of this particle of this size, okay, we simply compute rather reflectivity for all this M and then divide it by, by concentration. It's called not normalized rather reflectivity. Just to tell you how rather reflectivity actually increases, increases very rapidly with increasing the uh, equivalent diameter. So you see that it's, uh, from 1 to 8, we have uh, five orders of magnitude change in that. It's a tremendous change across the spectrum. OK, uh, the, the blue line, uh, the blue curve stands for uh, horizontal polarization and uh, red for vertical polarization. And again, for vertical polarization, the sort of effective size is small. Okay, that's a horizontal polarization. So uh, that means that for uh, vertical polarization, we have a little bit smaller uh, rather effective result. Okay, uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, for S band, we can use almost exclusively uh, a relay approximation, simple analytical formula for computing rather effective. It's not the fact for C band and X band. So that simple D to the 6 dependence is not valid for C band and X band. So we have some sort of a uh, deviation of these curves. Okay, it's not uh, the shape of this curve is like a little bit different. And that reflects the fact that about 5 centimeters we start uh, uh, experiencing resonance scattering effect for C band and about three millimeters at X band. Then if you look at the similar thing, just similar uh, normalized rather repeated factor as a function of, a, uh, of the equivalent diameter for raindrops, gravel and snow, all right, you see such a tremendous difference. Here, as I mentioned, it was 7.2 dB. Okay. And here, because for snow, rather reflectivity is a, is a fourth moment, not sixth moment. So, rather reflectivity increases much, at much slower pace, much slower rate, with increasing uh, diameter. So that means that for the same size of snowflakes, okay, the rather reflectivity will be almost two orders of magnitude smaller for snow compared to rain. That's why we never observe high differential, high rather activities in snow. 
uh, commonly uh, pure rain produces radio effectiveness up to 55 dBc, for example. 55 dBc. Okay, and uh, the radio effectiveness 35 dBc considered to be very high in snow. That means it's very heavy snow, and, uh, uh, and then the difference is about 20 dB, which is about two orders of magnitude. Seven? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In this plot, <coughs> so set depends on the dielectric constant. Yes, that and depends on the electric constant. You get this plot, this difference, yes. uh, for the slowest considering the dielectric constant of ice or or no. Um, no, here, 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 no, no, no. Here we are, we are, we are using this, using this formula, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, rho s is proportional to d sub coefficient d two minus one point one. Okay. Of course, this coefficient can change depending on rain, depending on on, on on the degree of rain of snow for. Run snow for the same size of snowflakes, you can uh, increase this coefficient. About factor five sometimes. Okay. So that means that this can go up a little bit. This can go up a little bit for uh, run snow. But nevertheless, since this, this dependence is valid both for run and, uh, and uh, uh, non run snow, so we still have very different. Pace, a different rate, different uh, sort of uh, yeah. okay, slope of these curves. So snow and, uh, and rainbows. And also Grotto that has a uh, density of, power of uh, solid ice. So far we look at this relatively small sizes or Rain, we're looking at raindrops or snowflakes or uh, small drop, say up to 8 millimeters. <coughs> then those slides illustrate how complicated the dependencies of normalized radar effectivity become uh, for larger sizes. So you see a lot of non-monotonicity here. Okay. Curves that are really non monotonic. And uh, for dry hail, especially for melting hail. Another uh, important thing is that we now we start seeing a lot of difference, differences for different wavelengths. Okay. For example, for S band, for dry hail and, uh, and melting hail, radar effectivity can be. 10 dB or even say 20 dB or even 30 dB more than for certain field sizes or for, 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 for field storm of certain size than it's for example a shorter wave, X band or C band. So X band, not all this curve is uh, uh, in, in, this, in these two plots. X band is, uh, is green, C band is, is red, and S band is. And uh, in the rather <coughs> uh, rather meteorology, uh, this difference was called hail signal. In other words, the dual wavelength radars that were utilized for hail detection. So if they see the, the if uh, they see the difference in radar effectivity at, at say at 10 centimeter, at 3 centimeter, they are attributed to the presence of hail. Of course, if they look at rain, this effectivity is up. Approximately equal. So uh, that's uh, that's and also you see how how non-monotonic the dependence, especially at, at, at uh, shorter wavelength, because we have some non-monotonicity for uh, for large wavelengths, but you know those are will will start repeating this sort of waves for very very large. Uh, part of the average that, that actually never occurred in nature. Now then melting snowflakes, uh, the similar thing in the, in, the, in, the, in the bright band, for example, we see this sort of dependence of this normalized radar effect on the diameter. 
okay. And again, uh, here, unfortunately, we have a different color for S than like for, for S values red and C values blue. You see again that the S band, the bright band signature is really stronger than the S, C band, and X band, where we can melt the snow. Once we can really melt, the really big, big size melt the snow. Also, has to be taken into consideration. What's very often people uh, say, uh, take the algorithms that have been developed, say, for example, for the next rap in the United States. For the network that operates at S band, 11 centimeter, 10 to 11 centimeter, rather wavelength. Okay, they try simply blindly and automatically apply a lot of algorithms to shorter wavelengths. Like for DWD, you operate at C band. Well, now it's very popular, X band becomes very popular, uh, rather frequency that is being used. So, but this, because of this difference, even at rather effectivity, I'm not talking about other polymetric variables. So such a mechanical transfer, a blind transfer of the algorithms, different formulas, and it is not, not legitimate okay, because of this uh, dependency on the variable. Differential effectivity is the most important polymetric variable, so we may dwell a little bit longer on the uh, explanation of the physical meaning of differential effectivity in relation to physical properties of hydrogenics. So this is a difference, either, uh, this is, in, in the log scale, there's a difference between rather effectivity measured horizontal polarization, vertical polarization. So again, from the previous formulas, it turns out that differential effectivity depends on the particle size, shape, orientation, density, and water contour. We are talking about mixed phase particles. But it is, not, it is not depending on the concentration of particles because the ratio in linear scale all right, of a uh, power of rather effectivity, horizontal depth of polarization. So it doesn't depend on concentration. That means it provides some very independent type of information uh, compared to rather effectivity. We complement that in a in a way that will help us to uh, resolve a lot of ambiguities when we are dealing with radar effectivity. But radar effectivity is a function of, is proportional both to concentration and size of hydrogen. Okay, and this big dilemma is very difficult to using only one variable, radar effectivity, to distinguish between these two factors. It's a long standing dilemma. Uh, uh, between the concentration and size. And once we get differential effectivity, so we can solve the dilemma. Differential effectivity is equal to zero degree if particles are spherical or randomly oriented. Okay. ZDI increase with decrease with latest density of water fraction. For equi-oriented hydrometers, hydrometers with the same orientation. I'd like to say rainbows, like that, all rainbows, or even like this, the axis of rotation will be very So, differential effectivity is, uh, is uh, simply the ratio of these two uh, ensemble average uh, squared of absolute value uh, is given as A. And you see that there's no dependence of, on D, on the diameter. It depends only on the shape through these parameters Li, LA, and Lb, and the electric constant. And again, I keep saying that if, if epsilon uh, is very small, for example, close to 1, then these two factors are smaller compared to 1, and ZDR becomes close to 1 regardless of, of the shape. And that's something uh, should be taken into account all the time. Uh, these are the dependencies of uh, differential objectivity on the Fibonian diameter of rain for three 
radar wavelength for the temperature of 20 degrees centigrade. So yeah, S band is uh, S band is just very monotonic dependence, which is green. Okay, we have very strong resonance C band, about six millimeter and we have some resonance, although smaller resonance at X band, about 3.5 millimeters. Okay, uh, so from this you can say that differential reflectivity is a good measure of median range of diameter. Because it depends on diameter. Okay, it's very strong. I mean, definitely very sensitive to certain size of raindrops, resonance sizes, for which these resonance parameters close to 1, 1.5, 2, etc., etc. Okay, the strength of these resonances depends on the temperature. Uh, because of, uh, because epsilon depends on the temperature. And if you look at the, uh, the that previous slide that, uh, explaining the whole concept of interference, okay, the, 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 the best interference, the best cancellation of two reflected waves can take from two surfaces actually occurs when there is no impurity electric, when there is no losses in the medium. That means that imaginary part of epsilon should be close to zero. And uh, what happens, um, uh, imaginary part of epsilon for water increases with decreasing temperature. Okay, so we have stronger resonances, uh, stronger resonances for higher temperatures than for lower temperatures. And I will show that uh, hopefully in the next slide, I guess. Oh yes, that what that shows the difference just in temperature because of this uh, because the difference in a, in, a, in a resonance in different uh, uh, difference in a, in, a, in, a, in a mechanism of interference because if you look for example at uh, uh, S band there is not much difference over there the strongest the strongest difference temperature dependence actually uh, around the resonance at C band so this is 30, 30 degrees centigrade, this is 0 degrees centigrade. And if you look at these two epsilons, okay, for 30 degrees centigrade, the imaginary part of epsilon is much smaller than compared to the 0 degree. So the imaginary part is smaller, that means loss is smaller, and the interference can be uh, materialized in, to the full extent. So it can be full cancellation or um, very efficient amplification. All right, for X band, for X band, uh, this I guess in the air or something. But anyway, just uh, for X band, these are these the are, uh, are much smaller and uh, less pronounced due to the higher. Uh, what about pristine crystals? There's a lot of crystals with very non-spherical shape in, shapes in atmosphere. And, there are set, and the, uh, the growth of crystals depends on the surrounding temperature. The crystals are growing from the... Uh, there are different mechanisms for, uh, uh, for, for growing, but we can tell that, for example, the crystals at, at the very top of the clouds, they, they are not very non-spherical. That they're usually irregular crystals with uh, with the shapes that not very different on average from spherical view, on irregular shapes. Okay. However, there are certain uh, temperature intervals where the crystals with, with certain shape like dendrites or plates or needles grow. For example, plates and dendrites, which are very very oblate type of hydrometers. Yeah, they usually grow between minus 10 and minus 15 degrees centigrade. Okay, needles are growing between minus 4 to minus 5 uh, degrees centigrade. But you see that there is a, a the difference in differential reflectivity dependence on axis ratio for prolate types of crystals and oblate type of crystals. Okay. So oblate type of crystals like plates, okay, 
Just a quick question, what does pristine mean in this context? Pristine, pristine means when we have uh, uh, when we have just one individual crystal. Ah. One individual, not, not a combination of two crystals. So it's not about the composition of the no, crystal. No, not the composition, uh, it's just one solitary. individual crystal. Yeah. Okay. One individual crystal. It's not, not small flake, I would say. Okay. So, and again, from looking at differential reflectivity, the maximum varies. Okay, you can distinguish if we are dealing with plates, or we are dealing with, need, uh, with plates, or we are dealing with needles. And for um, understanding ice microphysics and the mechanisms for uh, producing ice in the cloud, it's very, very important. In other words, uh, because of this high sensitivity to the type of the crystals, uh, differential reflectivity is very important for uh, elucidation, clarification, the microphysical processes, process of uh, small growth, for example. And I will talk about that a little bit in the, in the last lectures. And we'll discuss different microphysical processes and their fingerprints on, on polymetric rather variables. Differential reflectivity of dry snow. Okay, the perfect linear dependence on snow density for a given uh, for a given aspect ratio. It's very important because uh, uh, the degree of rhyming, degree of rhyming that what determines very often the type of precipitation <coughs> close to the ground, for example. That depends that determines the uh, the appearance of the uh, melting layer signature, the process of the melting layer. Okay. And it, it turns out that we can figure out what is the degree of random looking just at differential objectivity because of this fantastic linear dependence. Okay. Uh, these are conclusions that I already uh, discussed uh, somewhat. Okay. And uh, it's again, you have to look into that uh, table which just give you the general idea about how this density actually changes throughout uh, the spectrum of hydrometry. So it's from <coughs> changes of the order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude. For heavily aggregated snow, it's uh, uh, 100 of gram per centimeter cube. For N is 1. For hail, uh, solid hail is close to 1. Drop will usually in this range. Moderate aggregated snow, heavily aggregated snow. And those can be distinguished uh, quite well, um, at least in differential reflectivity. Of course, we need to know more or less the area of the ratio. That's another sort of uncertainty. Okay, but one thing is uh, uh, one, has to, one has to keep in mind is that the area is higher for crystals than for large aggregated snowflakes. Okay, it is generally lower for dry snow than for rain. That's probably two most important uh, uh, conclusions regarding the and uh, the dependence of the differential reflectivity on size can be very, very complicated for, say, melting hailstones for very large particles. Okay, for dry hail, for dry hail, here in the just once we uh, display these dependencies, we uh, take into account the, the orientation as well. Because uh, hailstones, uh, they fall, they, they experience tumbling behavior when they fall. So this orientation, the, uh, the orientation of hailstones is uh, semi-chaotic, semi semi semi-random orientation. And because of this factor, because dependence of differential reflectivity <coughs> on the randomness of this orientation, so we are, uh, we have relatively small differential reflectivities for dry paper. However, we may have a negative differential reflectivities because of the for, for dry cave stones, for especially for smaller uh, uh, wavelength, because of this uh, uh, resonance effect. In other words, it sort of seems counterintuitive when the when the, if the if the cave stone have this large dimension horizontal, vertical, and, and uh, small event is vertical, but nevertheless, the, uh, the rather effectivity for horizontal polarization is less 
a lot of things are difficult for us. And that's a result of this complexity of scatter. Results of complexity of scatter. Of course, the, the, these big particles, they are uh, reflected, uh, uh, this incident energy in very different directions in, in very, very uh, in peculiar way. So, uh, sometimes we are in, in the backscattering direction, they're getting results that it looks a little bit surprising and counter counterintuitive. For wet hair, look here, for wet hair, I think you're talking about, it, actually it's basically for melting hailstones. So we have a, a wet hair start melting, smaller hailstones usually melt very fast. And they make this rainbow part of the uh, sun spectrum, say from 0 to 8 millimeters. Okay, so here we have rain, okay, here we have hail, melting hail with different degree of melting. All right, and these are different rather wavelengths. Okay, S band, C band, X band. Okay, you see that those dependencies are very, very complicated. But one thing which, which is clear that uh, uh, we have very strong resonance at C band, and this resonance effect at C band for uh, raindrops of six, about six millimeters, that produce a lot of problems for C-band. In other words, C-band may not be a very good uh, wavelength for rather meteorological application. And we can figure out that this, for example, if wet hail is mixed with rain, then this signature can be so, can so, can overwhelm the signal from hail so much that differential effectivity in melting hail at C-band is not small as opposed to S band. Because for S band, we'll talk about that later, but I'd like to make a remark before. Okay, for in an S band, hail, for example, is distinguished from snow, from, from, from rain, just um, by, the, uh, by the fact that differential objectivity is small, or hail is small uh, compared to differential objectivity of rain. So, but uh, at C band, the situation is quite different. In other words, differential activity doesn't decrease in hail as well. So, uh, it's, it's quite problematic. It's much more difficult to uh, get hail at C band as compared to S band. But we'll talk about uh, that in more detail uh, in, the, in the lecture number five. Also, uh, if we have differential, uh, if, if, if we have mixed phase hydrometers, then uh, differential, it, it, it depends if we have uh, water coated spheroid or ice coated spheroid with the same uh, fraction of water. So if you, get, if you have melting grapple, for example, grapple falls to the, to the warm uh, air and melts, then we have very strong dependence like that of the differential activity of ground on the mass water content that is acquired during this melt. Okay. So there is still dependence. However, if we have a freezing radar, like for example, radar which is lofted in the updrafts, uh, super cool radars, they start freezing from outside. Okay, they're freezing from outside. But this ice cold is fair. And again, for the same size of these particles, for the same even mass water content, differential activity makes distinction between these two. Okay. That's, uh, that's, that's very important, especially from, any, for, from the standpoint of any uh, microphysical reveals. But the bottom line is any presence of water in hydrogen increases the differential The narrow melting snowflakes can be very high, more than 3 dB, even higher, depending on what, it, what melts. If aggregated snow melts, okay, maybe 3 dB, but if we have just pristine crystals that melt, that originally have very non spherical shape, that ZDR can be even higher. Uh, and again, I just uh, this uh, sentence repeats what I said before. Water coated, I mean, it has higher ZDR than ice cold.
Uh, let's talk about differential phase now. And again, uh, I would like to simply read and show this cartoon, it's showing just, just to say that uh, differential phase is uh, attributed to propagation effect. In other words, one, once the signal is transmitted by the radar, the wave propagates to the medium field of non uh, spherical hydrometers, then we get this differential phase. And you remember these formulas from the previous lectures. Okay. And this phase should be distinguished from backscattering phase that occurs during this uh, reflection from individual hydrometers in a rather resolution volume. Okay, but they sum up and make uh, the total differential phase. Uh, the specific differential phase is one half of the, uh, of the radial derivative of the total differential phase. It's a very important parameter that is uh, now is widely used for estimation of uh, rainfall, especially at larger, uh, at, at, at shorter uh, radar wave. Okay, but CDP is uh, usually monotonic function okay, of, of range. And the KDP is a derivative. What is good about differential phase measurement is that it's phase measure. It's phase measure. For example, uh, this phase, what, what phase mean? And yet, so we discussed in the first lecture this, uh, uh, the shape of an electromagnetic wave that is being say, transmitted and received. Here we have an H wave that is received and the radio. And the wave and, and the V wave, the vector of polarization received at the radio. But the bottom line that, you know, they are sort of shifted a little bit in time. In other words, maximum and minimum occur at slightly different time. Okay, and this difference is proportional to differential phase. Basically. Okay, and again, this the H and the V for H and V in the phase, uh, in the phase uh, factors are different. Okay, but you know, if for example the waves are uh, subjected to uh, attenuation, for example, H is attenuated. If we have attenuation, that means that the, the amplitude of H wave becomes small. An amplitude of V wave may be also become small, right? Okay. But what is important is that the, the phase remains intact. It is not affected by attenuation. It is not affected by miscalibration. For example, one of these can be totally miscalibrated and maybe just very small, have maybe small amplitude, or we may have small amplitude, or whatever. Okay, but it doesn't affect the, the phase. And that's, uh, that's a very fantastic and really unique, uh, actually, uh, property of the differential phase. Or another factor that can affect the amplitudes of these waves is partial beam blockage, for example. So partial beam blockage can affect differently H and B wave. Okay, it affects H, B can affect dramatically sometimes. But anyway, once we keep track of this, uh, phase or differences in the, in, the, uh, in the location of these sinusoids along the time line, okay, then you, you are fine. You are, you, the, the, this FDP is not affected by those effects. So it's very important, very important and fundamental property of FDP. It's not affected by other miscalibration, attenuation, and partial wind blockage. Very important. So it makes it very attractive for uh, all sorts of measurements. Okay, this is KDP is a function of the <coughs> volume diameter flow uh, in a similar manner as Z and ZDR. And uh, you see for C bar you can even have some of negative uh, KDP, which is a result of, uh, of the resonance. And generally speaking, KDP is uh, uh, is uh, inversely proportional to other wavelength, so it's smaller for uh, S-band, which is green curve, okay, and it's 
much higher for X band and S band, sort of linearly proportional to inversely proportional to uh, <coughs> to rather greater. But one thing that should be kept in mind: KDP is low in noise in light rain and snow. In other words, you see this for very small raindrops, for small raindrops, the KDP is, is very quite quite small. Okay, it can be very high in oriented crystals because. Uh, like when the same way L has differential reflectivity. It is linearly proportional to particle concentration as opposed to differential reflectivity. That makes it attractive for uh, rainfall measurements as well. Uh, and again, in many sense, KDP has uh, similar, uh, similar dependencies, exhibit similar dependencies on, on the lateness, density, and water content. Uh, as differential effective. Okay, and for spherical or randomly oriented particles, uh, KDP is equal to zero uh, as well as differential effective. So it's a lot of so there's a lot of so, so, so there are some differences, but a lot of similarities between ZDR and KDP. Uh, KDP can be utilized for estimation of rain rate and liquid water content because there's some relations. They're not linear and linear relations, but uh, not far from linear relations. That makes them attractive for estimation of liquid water content of rain. Okay, uh, rain rate because those dependencies are such much more screwed up for uh, reflectivity. Also, uh, specific differential phase is almost linear proportional to ice water content, ice, ice water content, snow, crystals, and light aggregate snowflakes. So you can quantify ice water content much better than rather effective in fact. This is just an example of this formula, a simple linear relation as that. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, this equation was uh, performed better in some range of rain dogs. Point KDP is close to zero. Okay, well, that's okay, yeah. The, the, we'll, we'll talk about that in, in full details uh, in, in lecture six. But uh, yes, you're absolutely right. For light rain rate, KDP is very noisy. Okay, and dependence is relatively weak. Okay, and, and again, there's measurement effects that makes it that, that makes its utilization problematic. Okay. So, because uh, the, the measurement errors, are, you need to have simply high value of KDP, high enough value of KDP to make uh, uh, to, uh, to to make reliable measurements of rain rate. So, uh, generally speaking, we can say so. The KDP is useful, say, for rainfall uh, measurements, say at S band, if rain rate is more than 10 centimeter, for uh, C band if rain rate is more than five six millimeter per hour, and for X band three about three millimeter per hour. So it's a very simple rule of thumb. Okay, so the uh, rain rate should be equal to rather wavelength. So below that KDP is not good. Above that it's, it works very well. However, everything if, 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 if you have some big grand average uh, averaging, okay, when all this uh, uh, statistical error cancels the child, well, uh, we can get uh, uh, meaningful results even for lower wavelengths. Uh, for, for lower ranges. But I will talk about that in, in the last lecture. Uh, again, this is backscatter differential phase. Remember that we have this uh, additional uh, additional term in the top of differential phase. Okay. Yes, this this term, the backscattered differential phase, which is uh, uh, which is uh, resulted because of the individual act of scattering from from uh, from high dimensions. It's not cumulative; it's local. Okay. This is this is a formula showing uh, this uh, plot showing the dependencies of backscatter, the, the, first of all, the magnitude dependence of backscattered uh, differential phase at 
three different wavelengths and for two different temperatures. And you see that the test band is almost negligible, only for very, very large raindrops. Uh, delta can be sort of meaningful, different from zero. However, it can be quite substantial, as you get depending on temperature, for that C band and quite substantial for X band. All right, and we did it and, and, uh, 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 together with uh, people in this group, and uh, Dr. Snooker Tromo actually presented uh, presentation at the just uh, the last European Radiological Conference just on the subject of this delta. Because we cannot ignore that in the backscatter differential phase. Okay, we can uh, ignore the backscatter differential phase for rainfall measurement and spec. So the separation of these two factors, delta and KDP, in a total differential phase is very important. We can can't be ignored at X band. It can be ignored at S band. At C band sometimes, but not uh, overall in the next band. Attenuation and differential attenuation of rain. So uh, these are relatively simple formulas that uh, relate uh, attenuation at H and depolarization expressed in B per kilometer. Uh, on, on the other wavelength, and uh, uh, the imaginary part of the ensemble average uh, scattering uh, coefficients. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that basically this is, uh, this can be expressed as an integral of a side distribution. So uh, the dependencies are shown, this is dependencies of. Uh, And again, uh, we have different, if, if the propagation occurs in the media composed of non-spherical hydrometers, then there are differences in the uh, specific attenuations of horizontal polarization and vertical polarization. This difference is called differential attenuation. And differential attenuation is something that affects differential activity negative, negatively, and A, something affects rather because they become biased by estimation. All right, if you look at this, so this is a, this, these are plots for normalized uh, specific attenuation, and these are plots for normalized differential attenuation. That was difference in attenuation factors okay. per meter, per kilometer. Okay. So you can see the difference in the scale over here. Of course, at all wavelength with increasing, uh, with increasing size, all these uh, uh, specific attenuations uh, generally increase. However, at S band it stays very, very small. Okay. Where the C band, the X band, for example, is many order of magnitude high. So that's that's the biggest problem with shorter wavelength radius. So before uh, introducing polarimetry to uh, to the X band measurements, for example, measurement short wave It was very difficult to measure precipitation because radar effectivity uh, was so much biased by attenuation. And this is illustrated by this, these graphs. Okay, there's some difference definitely again because of resonance effects uh, affect especially imaginary part of the uh, scattering amplitudes, difference for two different uh, temperatures. 30 zero degree, okay, and sometimes differential, uh, uh, specific attenuation is always positive, so the wave can only attenuate, it can be amplified once it propagates through the medium. However, differential attenuation can be even negative, that means that sometimes uh, the wave with vertical propagation, can, the, the vertical polarization can attenuate more, be attenuated more than the wave with the wave with, uh, horizontal polarization. Although generally the opposite is true. These are also very complicated dependencies uh, showing the, uh, how specific and differential attenuation depend on hailstone diameter, different 
wavelength, for dry hail, for wet hail. That's again, I'm simply showing you this, just simply to, uh, to make two points. First of all, they increase dramatically, especially the specific attenuation. The hail produces tremendous attenuation at all wavelengths. And uh, the differences in the uh, in, uh, in radar wavelength can be also dramatic. Uh, specific attenuation is almost linearly related to uh, rain rate, which makes it potentially very uh, interesting and useful variable for rainfall estimation. So the problem of how to measure the specific talk about that in the next lecture. So because for regard to look at for example S band, the, uh, the this is A uh, is almost linearly proportional to rain rate. And it's almost linear almost linear dependence for on rain rate at C band and uh, less linear at X band. However there is some sort of a, a difference uh, depending on the temperature of the rainforest. So that has to be kept in mind. But generally speaking, those are the dependencies of uh, A at temperature 20 degrees, specific attenuation, expressed in the meter kilometers, at S band, or C band, and X band. Okay. What does it mean? Let's say, let's say 10 uh, rain rate 10 millimeters per hour. Okay. So at S band we have uh, uh, specific attenuation of only maybe two, three thousandths of dB per month. So if uh, the propagation path is highly kilometer, it's still negligible. However, much, much more, it's more than say 0.1 dB per kilometer for uh, this uh, rain rate of 10 minutes per hour at X band. So what this means that this A is, uh, so in a, in, in, a, in a matter of 10 kilometers, the, uh, the radar activity will be attenuated it's more, than, more than one or two dB, because it's one way attenuation. So it's the way back for the two of those. So two dB easily for 10 millimeter per hour. 20 dB is, uh, is very, uh, it's very serious bias, which has to be dealt with. Cross correlation coefficient. Cross correlation coefficient is uh, uh, basically it uh, characterizes the synchronicity of uh, variability of, uh, say, the signal. As a sign of the function of time uh, at horizontal vertical polarization. In other words, how synchronous they are they're changing as a, as a function of time. For example, this, this, this one of them, okay. And, uh, and this is another one, it's, it's just repeats. The first one, okay, or maybe a little bit different, something like that. If it repeats, it is H, and this is V. So if those are almost identical, then we are talking about high cross-correlation coefficient, high correlation between these two waves. And uh, uh, cross-correlation coefficient is another very, very important from the practical standpoint for rhetoric variable. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk about later. It's better to show some examples of the data uh, than just to uh, than dwell on the theory. But I would like just, just to uh, have a few remarks here. If you have spherical particles, okay, for spherical particles, Rolich V is always one. In other words, all this H and V, although they are fluctuating signals, but fluctuations will be totally synchronous at H and V. Okay. Another thing is we have non-spherical particles with equal axis ratios. It also turns out that there will be, uh, there will be one cross-correlation coefficient. 
However, if you have non-spherical particles but with different active ratios or identical particles with different orientations, so we will get less than one cross correlation position. And again, if you have particles of different phase composition, cross correlation coefficient tends to be uh, decreased. Again, cross correlation coefficient sort of summarizes the diversity of particle sizes, shapes, and orientations in the radar resolution volume, and also different habits in the radar resolution volume. So, and uh, it usually decreases with increase of lateness, randomness, orientations, and water content. It's very sensitive to resonance sizes, where uh, backscatter differential phase very significant. It also, it can be shown uh, that when uh, delta is uh, very unstable, then and large, then rho g also tends to be low. Uh, another extremely important uh, practical implication of using rho g is that it's very close for one for most hydrometers and significantly lower than one for non meteorological scatterers. So it's something that was immediately appreciated all of of, by all of the uses of the uh, polymetric radius. So you can look at the RHV, the field of RHV, and you will see immediately when we have the echo from the ground clutter, or birds, or insects, or bats, or chaff, or whatever is non meteorological. Okay, all these flying creatures in the atmosphere. And rain. It's very, very important classification parameter. Uh, Rho HV is notice, noticeably lower than one in melting hail and snow. Melting hail and melting snow. As well as rain containing drops of red consignments. But most of the time it's very close to one for the of particles. Okay, then uh, if you have very uh, non spherical types of uh, deformed particle shapes due to collisions or breakup, then cross correlation coefficient also tends to be lower. Dr. Nolasco spectral wind, in this lecture course we do not put much emphasis on uh, uh, just standard uh, Doppler variables. It's supposed to be known very well already by most of the people. Uh, but again, I just repeat here that this is, uh, uh, this is how the mean Doppler velocity is uh, determined from the argument of the autocovariance. And this formula is one of the previous slides in the previous lecture. And how the spectrum width that characterizes the width of the Doppler spectrum. And Doppler spectrum usually close to Gaussian. So if we have this velocity, and this is spectrum. OK, so the mean Doppler velocity is a, is a, is a mean uh, frequency or mean Doppler velocity and sigma v characterizes the width of this uh, So, uh, uh, in practical terms, basically, uh, mean Doppler velocity characterizes mean radial velocity of the scatterers. So, it's very, very uh, uh, efficient parameter for, uh, say, figuring out the, the wind velocity. Although you have to uh, keep in mind that it's, there is only, only uh, radial velocity radial velocity component along the beach. Where spectrum width characterizes the wind shear within the radar resolution volume, the change of the Doppler velocity, and also turbulence intensity. So the turbulence for more for stronger turbulence, usually spectrum width is higher as the Doppler spectrum is broader. Uh, from the fact that this argument of uh, any, any complex number can be and ambiguously find out only within minus pi to plus pi, okay, the two pi interval. We can measure this Doppler velocity only in a so-called Nyquist interval of lambda divided by d2, dt, where dt is a pulse repetition period. Okay, so or plus minus lambda from lambda divided by 4 t, which comes out straight from this formula. So and uh, this actually creates uh, some problems in estimating of the biggest of, uh, of, of, of Doppler velocity, especially at shorter wavelength. Okay. So 
for, for example, it's, it's required to measure more or less with plus minus 40 meters per second for any uh, meaning, meaningful practical uh, utilization of local velocity. But if you take, for example, 3.2 centimeter wave and T over, say, about 1 milliseconds, so you, are, you end up with plus minus about 7.58, about 8 millimeter per, millimeter per second uh, an ambiguous interval for x -bet. So you have to do something uh, for that in order to increase this interval. And I'm just mentioning in passing that uh, when you have different pulse repetition frequencies or transmission uh, segments of the pulses uh, with different interval between the pulses, Okay, we can, uh, we can increase this interval some, some, somehow in the, uh, uh, artificially and uh, this interval can be increased and, uh, uh, and, and the uh, degree of this increase depends on the difference between the two, uh, uh, two parts of the tissue period. Okay, I don't, I don't spend much time on that. If you have any question, I can comment. But, uh, Let's move on because I'd like to finish first lecture in one hour and a half. Okay. Uh, then, the Vida CC did the R scatter plots and SC and X band simulated from many measured drop size distributions. So, it's really a drop size distribution measured in Oklahoma with the 2D video hysterometer, and we simulate as uh, Z and ZDR at different wavelengths, at different temperatures, just to give you an idea, okay, how ZDR uh, changes with radar reflectivity. What is the range of radar reflectivity? What is the range of differential reflectivity? At S-band, at C-band, or C-band, you have much, much higher differential reflectivities. Remember that because of resonance effects for, uh, for radars of about 6 million in diameter, you have big radars, it's really they are manifested by the presence of high differential reflectivities. At X-band, ZDR a little bit higher on average than an S-band, okay, but not, not, there, there are no such a, a strong resonance effects shown over here, like the C-band. So this is KDP, the similar uh, slides, again giving you idea about what is the change of the KDP in degrees per kilometer, what is the standard for S-band, C-band, and X-band. And again, because of this uh, inverse proportion to lambda, to radio wavelength, so uh, KDP changes in much, much wider range than for S-band. All right, it's basically the function of radio reflectivity. However, it's uh, the scatter plot uh, can be very, very wide, especially at C-band and X-band when we have most uh, resonance scattering effects. Uh, these are cross correlation coefficients, and again, for rain, you see how high is usually the cross correlation coefficient, more than 0.99 usually. Okay. And for X band, it's also more, more 0.99. For C band, it can be much lower again because of the resonance effects. It's something uh, that can be, uh, can be uh, sort of considered an advantage of a C band or disadvantage of C band. I will talk about that later a little bit. Uh, then, uh, how we can, if we can, how, how different are, say, radar reflectivity at S band and C band? Say, at C band, in rain, we may have radar reflectivity quite higher than the corresponding radar reflectivity at S band for the same rain. Okay, differential reflectivities. Okay, differential reflectivities at C band usually higher than S band. Especially uh, when the differential field themselves are pretty large, more than 2 dB. Okay. Uh, Z at X band is usually higher than at S band. So this should be uh, definitely uh, taken into account when you do networking of different radars. So even for it's, uh, the difference can be about 2 dB or so. And uh, that's, that's not, not, not negligible difference. So then ZDR, S-band versus ZDR, X-band. Again, you see, uh, at a certain, 
range of differential objectivity, you see uh, quite a bit of difference. So you have a measure of text and as well. On average, they are a little bit high. But this, this, but this difference depends on CDR itself. Uh, these are cross correlation coefficients. Uh, uh, okay, I'll just no, that's kind of differential phase, basically. Okay, this cross correlation coefficient, we already seen these panels in one of the previous slides. But this simply gives you an idea about the variability of backscatter differential phase at C-band. It can be very large, but only for quite high reflectivities, a very uh, intense range. The reflectivity is about 50, 45, 50 degrees. Whereas at X-band, it's uh, quite significant, uh, starting from reflectivities of 30 degrees or so, 30, 40, 50 degrees. It's not extremely high, but it's within, say, 10, 15 degrees. And that's why we are doing this work with, uh, with Dr. Zilke and others. All right, finally, uh, I would like to simply, uh, we'll get into more lively, interesting stuff because I'll start showing more and more images, okay, with more and more practical results. And this is how, uh, how just this typical uh, composite plot of rather effectivity, differential effectivity, cross correlation coefficient, and differential phase look like. Okay. First of all, this different this this uh, S band measurements, typical mesoscale connective system. So the squall line ahead, then some sort of transition zone, and then the stratiform shield is forming behind the squall line. Typical MCS. They're not very common probably in this area, but there are some sort of a, uh, the, the big systems in this area may uh, have some features typical for the classical MCSs that are so common in the United States. Uh, look here at differential reflectivity. This is a non-meteorological scatter. Why we decide? Because cross-correlation coefficient is very, very, very low. So differential reflectivity is very high for uh, insects here, and uh, a little bit lower than, than for birds. Okay, and uh, for stronger convection, differential reflectivity is high. Uh, more events, for example, study for part. Okay. And uh, in snow, because we are looking at some angle, 0.4, uh, this part is from the radar, we have lower differential activity, like I said. Cross correlation coefficient, very low in non meteorological scatterers, can be quite low, quite low in a convective, in a, in a convective line, okay. but it's very high in rain over there the low effectivity, very, very low in the bright band. Here we are uh, uh, dealing with the bright band. Differential phase is uh, increasing function of range at each azimuth, but in the azimuth along the squall line shows very, very uh, rapid growth. Okay, and that rapid growth is very useful for, uh, for quantification of rain. Probably a couple more slides, and that's it for the first lecture. Okay, this is a, a typical RHI, rather reflectivity, differential reflectivity. Look here how well the uh, frozen hydrometers and, and, uh, and uh, liquid hydrometers uh, are separated in terms of differential reflectivity. Okay. And uh, this differential phase that increases again in distance. Cross correlation coefficient shows nicely localization of the melting layer because it drops in the melting layer. Okay. And there is not much of indication of that in the radar field. It's not pronounced by band in this situation. Whereas cross correlation coefficient coefficient and ZDR is much more sensitive to that, which is very useful for uh, detection of the melting layer. And this is simply the, uh, uh, the last slide of the lecture, which I took just this morning. There's examples of the fields of reflectivity in Dr. Velocity in clear, in clear air. I'd like to give you simply some sort of a... Uh, this, this now it's a muggy, warm night in Oklahoma. Very warm. A lot of insects. 
and the radar is sensitive enough to see these insects up to the distance of 200 kilometers or so. So reflectivity is very small, but velocity shows this structure of wind very well. So you see, so this uh, green shows negative, negative uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, towards the radar, I mean from the radar, and positive that, uh, no, 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 this is quite opposite. So it's, 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 it's a northern wind uh, now here. So it's, it's opposite at the top of the direction. So it means that winds from north, northeast. Okay. So because here we have positive doctor velocities, and here we have negative doctor velocities. And the insects, actually, there's enough insects in central Oklahoma to provide actually very well monitoring of winds throughout, uh, throughout the whole season of the year, okay, within a distance of 200 kilometers. It's not the case in Germany. Okay, but in Germany we'll see probably something like this. I'm not sure you have so many bats. Okay, at this point, okay, I will finish and we'll get to uh, much more images level. We saw uh, 